Right, just looking at the numbers, they seem to be um, stabilising well over 100 people here today. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, and I hope you're going to get a lot out of the next hour or so. Uh, I'm Mark Shardlow. I was a BBC sports journalist for 30 years before becoming freelance last year. And that's when I joined the board of Active Derbyshire and Active Nottinghamshire. So I'm really thrilled that we're at this point today, having seen and heard what the staff and partners have achieved and the importance of it all. So it's an exciting day for me. I've got a vested interest in it. Um, before we start, uh, just a reminder why we're here. Uh, Today is an opportunity to explore uh, our shared vision and to develop ideas. In a moment, Professor Donna Hall will be telling us about her experiences working alongside residents and communities, and that's going to be fascinating. We'll also be joined by a panel of leaders from across our networks to discuss how we can work together to achieve our shared vision. And there'll be an opportunity for you to get involved and to ask questions. For now, though, can I ask if you can keep your microphones off and also your cameras off too, because that's going to help during the presentation. Uh, I'm sorry about that because it's lovely to see all your smiling faces looking at me. But if you can turn your microphones and cameras off, that would be great. We, the live caption function has been enabled for this session. So if you need it, that's there. And please feel free to uh, use the chat function for any questions that you've got. It's all there. Right, uh, to get things started, we're going to play a short video and it's to show you why it's time for all of us to make our move. We live in a busy world, hectic, suffocating, chaotic, with little time to do what's important. Surrounded by technology, on top of each other, with little space to move. Our streets, our communities, our villages, our towns, our city, our county. It's everywhere, all-encompassing, attacking our health, our enjoyment, our social and mental well-being and contributing to our climate crisis. Inactivity has taken over and Covid has made this so much worse. It affects us all. We need to change. We need our councils, schools, healthcare, workplaces, families, friends, communities, everyone to work together to lead the change, to make it happen, to start moving. It's all of us, all of the time, and now, we're ready to make our move. Are you? Um, well, someone who is here is the CEO of Active Knots and Active Derbyshire. It's Ilana Freestone, and Ilana is going to tell us more about making our move, uniting the movement in Knots and Derbyshire. Thank you, Mark, and hello, everyone. I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to tell you a bit about where we've got to and why. Um, the slide you see on the screen now explains the journey we've been on. And we've had over 700 people and organisations have connected over the last year, reflecting on the insight, shaping a shared vision, discussing future priorities and opportunities. And all the conversations we've had have been pulled together and sent checked independently by, by Press Red, as we've been part of, as Active Knots and Active Derbyshire have been part of those conversations. Many of you have been involved too, and you've helped us get to this point. It's, it's not the start or the finish, the conversations up to now and those we'll be having are all part of the work we need to do. So I guess I see this as a point in time as we emerge from COVID-19 to reset and crystallise a shared vision and direction for the next 10 years for Knotts and Derbyshire. One that's aligned and integrated to uniting the movement, the national strategy published by Sport England back in January. And I know I've said this before and it reiterates the essence of uh, Sport England's strategy, but to make the biggest difference that we can make to tackling inequalities and addressing inactivity, we need to be working together in the same direction. And that's why developing a shared vision and purpose is so important. And that's where we've got to. A 10 year plan that sets out shared vision, shared aims and articulates how we need to work together to achieve this. We've learned that change takes time and we're in it for the long run hence the 10 year time frame. It'll need refreshing as we go and we'll need to flex and adapt based on what we're learning. We've also learned that how we work, our united approach, as we call it in the strategy, is as important as what we do, which are our shared aims. 
It's very much about culture and ways of working, and we'll be hearing more on that from Donna and the panel. The action we take collectively from here is where our attention and focus now needs to be. Before we move on to the next clip, though, which explains the plan in more detail and fingers crossed it works, we'll have, we've got plan B after that if it doesn't. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to say thank you to all of you who've been part of the conversation so far, bringing your energy and enthusiasm. The input we've had has been fantastic. And I'd also like to thank my team who've been part of the conversations, but have also helped with much of the legwork in pulling, pulling the plan together. Thank you. Making our move, our shared vision for uniting the movement in Notts and Derbyshire. As communities, organisations and partners working together, we will dress inequality and empower everyone to be active in a way that works for them. But why is this important? Firstly, we'll be healthier, happier and more fulfilled. Secondly, communities feel safer, inclusive and connected. Thirdly, society is more equal, with money invested and saved in the right places. And finally, our environments are less polluted and better appreciated by communities. Our shared aims, what we're going to focus on. Creating a culture where everyone can be active and move more. Enabling children and young people to have a positive experience of being active throughout their childhood. Working with people and neighbourhoods experiencing the greatest inequality. Maximising the potential of physical activity to improve physical and mental health. Creating accessible, safe and inclusive places and environments for physical activity. Across all our aims, we will recognise the importance of walking that is accessible to everyone and promote the benefits and be conscious of the impact of physical activity on climate change and the environment. Through being active, we can create a fairer, stronger, healthier and greener society for all, which is especially important as we recover from COVID-19. How will we make our move? The power of a united approach. At the heart of this is people and communities owning the change they're trying to create by being involved and feeling empowered. We recognise that everyone and every place is different. We'll grow our insight and understanding of people's behaviour We need to understand how the environment impacts on being active and how our complex lives can make it difficult. Part of this is valuing different perspectives and the lived experience of communities. There are lots of people and organisations who have a part to play in helping people to be more active. This is our workforce. Key to the success of making our move is more collaboration across and between partners and sectors. We'll need to learn from what is and isn't working and adapt as we go, alongside advocating and influencing for changes to policy and practice. We can do more to ensure that our strategies, governance and processes support and enable active lives and environments, services and programmes are safe and accessible, designed, planned and delivered with being active in mind. How we invest our resources, both financial and human, ensuring it's proportionally focused on where the need is greatest will be important. Lots of our aims and ways of working are interconnected and interdependent. We know it's complex and we need to work with this. Time to make our move. We all have a part to play. We need to be united. We need to build from where we are and act together. Now is the time to make our move. Uh, so that's how we want to make our move. Uh, for some inspiration about how we're going to achieve it, uh, we'll be hearing from Professor Donna Hall and some local leaders. I'll quickly introduce Donna and then, then hand over to the panel. Donna was uh, the CEO of Wigan Council for eight years and developed the Wigan deal, which was a relationship between uh, the residents, which improved services and resident satisfaction. She was accountable officer for the CCG at Wigan and created another social contract with residents while CEO at Chorley Council called the Chorley Smile. So she has lots of experience in working this way. And alongside Donna in the panel are going to be uh, three leaders from Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire who are going to share their perspectives about what this means 
for their work. And the panel is going to be supported by Michelle Skinner from Active Knots and Active Derbyshire, who's going to lead us through this section. So panellists, uh, be prepared and over to you. Hi everyone, my name is Professor Donna Hall and I'm currently the chair at Bolton NHS Foundation Trust uh, and also chair a think tank called New Local, whose mission is to try to promote community power, unlocking community power across the UK. So my background is I've been a chief exec in local government for around 20 years. Uh, the last job that I had was in Wigan where we did something quite remarkable with the local community that you may have heard about called the Wigan Deal. Uh, if you are interested in finding out more about the Wigan Deal, then the best thing to read is a publication by the King's Fund called Lessons from the Wigan Deal, which was published around a year and a half ago. The real kind of driver behind the Wigan Deal was a new social contract a new relationship with citizens and it didn't come about overnight we didn't suddenly go to bed knowing we had some problems and wake up with this great solution it was an iterative process that that went on and kept being refined all the time over a 10-year period and what the king's fund said about the deal and i'll talk about the outcomes in a little while was the things that made it different to other places and projects and initiatives that they'd seen was firstly clarity of purpose really simple and clear mission about what you're there to do and I think for any partnership like your own that's so important that you're crystal clear on purpose and very often organisations just drift into doing things they've always done or when new pots of funding become available they go for that and they're not clear on purpose or it becomes ill-defined over time or different people in the partnership have a different perception of what the purpose actually is so that's something that again I would encourage you as leaders in the system and everyone is a leader we're leading from every seat in the room whatever your role is to really be clear about purpose and clear on it and communicating that to each other to wider partnerships and to local people uh, is really important so clarity of purpose was the first lesson from the Wigan deal and the second one is constancy of purpose so very often we tend to chop and change our strategies, our plans, our mission statements, depending on the different leaders that come into our system, depending on feedback that we get, or depending on the kind of um, pot of money that becomes available from Sport England or wherever in that particular uh, year. But I think having that really long term constancy of purpose you know, where you, you stick with the same brand, you stick with the same messaging and it's everywhere and everyone understands what it means and they can explain it back to you. Um, I think very often, it, you know, people overcomplicate strategy, make it really um, obtuse so that no one really could tell you what a strategy says. Very often we have overlapping strategies that don't link together. Uh, my background is kind of strategy, policy, regeneration, um, and working with communities. I've done that all my life. Uh, and I've seen lots of strategies and written lots of strategies that haven't worked. The, the only one that has worked is this is the deal, really. I'll be honest, that's simplicity. It describes a relationship rather than a, a set of objectives, a really clear relationship with citizens. Um, so we, we started back in 2011 with the deal where we wanted to create a different relationship because we had no money. That was the first point. Um, we had to make £160 million pounds worth of savings and we were third on the list of cut councils through austerity right at the start. We were watching councils around us try to chop bits off services and reduce services or raise at the access threshold for services and we thought that was really counterproductive we basically were telling people go away get worse uh, get poorer get more in debt get thinner be drinking more alcohol and then come back and then you can access our services because you're bad enough to access them and we kind of thought to ourselves what do we have we've got to make all these savings but our assets are our people both the staff in the council 5,000 brilliant people 85 percent of them live in the borough and also the people who live in the borough. There are assets, 323,000 amazing people. Um, so let's tap into what we do have rather than concentrate on what we don't have and make salami slice savings chop, chop, chop across a, a wide variety of services so that they're basically stretched paper thin and they fall over. Um, we also at the time, so that was the first thing, having no money and knowing that we had to redefine our role. Second thing was uh, the fact that we did a piece of work with a woman called Hilary Cotton, who many of you will have read her book, Radical Help. We invited Hilary to come in, so we're going to do some work with us in a place called Worsley Mains, which is one of our more deprived social housing estates. We asked her to work with 
25 families whose children were on the edge of care being taken into care and we tried to work out what were we doing wrong with these families and why were we in this position many times it was generational children being taken into care whose whose parents had been taken into care um, and we mapped out on a wall over a 20 year period all the different interactions that we'd had whether we were in the police in social care uh, in criminal justice in drug and alcohol services housing services department of work and pensions and and costed it all up and in a year the families were costing the state between a quarter of a million and half a million per year per family and at the end of that year each family was in a worse position than they had been at the beginning and what we found we were we were spending money on continually interacting and transacting with them around a kind of uh, assessment and referral model so we weren't building a relationship with them or trying to help them or unravel some of the problems that they had and think about as neighbors how could we, they work differently in the local community public servants to support people to be better connected to have that infrastructure to develop a network of a social support network around them rather than have the state constantly doing what it was doing at great expense and not very effective outcomes so that was the second piece of creation of the deal the third thing was a piece of work we did with nesta uh, i'm sure you've heard of them around creative councils and adult social care and we found very similar findings we were assessing referring separately to each other we didn't have a plan for each individual person who required social care i remember myself when my mum was discharged and you'll have similar experiences yourself discharged from hospital she had 22 different bits of the nhs and social care descended and came up her path on one day it needs project management so that whole system is expensive and it's not person-centered it's not focused on the person what support they have in place what they like to do as a person what really drives them what their passions are so we completely with those three factors no money the work we did all with hillary on in children's services and the work we did with nesta in adult social care realized we had a problem um, and so we created a, a different way of working we called it the deal the first thing we did was to freeze council tax for 10 years because we realized that austerity wasn't just hitting us it was hitting people and um, eventually after 10 years of freezing council tax we worked out it was the equivalent of around 500 pounds per year per family so it's quite a, you know quite a bit of money there for people that's in people's pockets rather than being spent on propping up services that are not effective um so again my background i'm adopted and um, i just i've got a passion for kind of quality public service i've seen the impact of having really good public services and, and getting really great outcomes by using the assets and the people in a place and that's what kind of drives me to do what i do um it's great that there are people here from the nhs from the community and voluntary sector from local government from sports organizations it's brilliant that you've got this fantastic partnership here and the strength of partnership is is amazing but very often we design our own individual programs and fiercely protect them and don't work together to co-design them either with each other or with communities so for me the only thing that brings together all the disparate programs and partner agencies is place to its neighbourhoods um, and one of the things we did which again really made a difference was we developed integrated place-based teams around populations of 30 to 50,000 people and all the international evidence points to the fact that is the best footprint of of a, a neighbourhood it's quite a large neighbourhood but it's functioning as a way of getting public servants to talk to each other in a place about people and families and put in place the support that they need um, people were given the freedom, the free reign to do what they wanted that would make a difference to the individuals and the families. And as long as no one died, we were given, we gave people the courage and we backed them to succeed. And on the walls of the place based teams, people put, wrote, don't do anything if it doesn't help the family or the person. So we, we looked, when we looked at some of those 25 families Hillary was working with through the Life Project, and she talks about this in the book Radical Help. Some of them were on the edge of being of going into prison. Some of them had unserved sentences of a week, but they were scared of going back into prison. They thought they would lose the children. Um, so we had one woman in particular who had um, basically got bipolar disorder, but wasn't on the right medication, uh, was terrified to leave the house, uh, wouldn't answer the door when we knocked on the door and we were about to evict her. You know, you think what would be the outcome of doing that, of evicting her, sending her to prison 
for not sending the children to school who were being bullied at school. So trying to rebuild that family's confidence and self-esteem, starting with, with the mum by getting her med medication right, helping her to get volunteering role and then a job um, and working with the children. So, you know, we might have badged those children as obese, but obesity wasn't the main issue in their lives. There were many other things in their lives, you know, so an exercise program immediately wasn't the right thing. It's, it's that relational model, that deep listening to people that really makes the difference. Um, we employed an anthropologist who's brilliant, freelance anthropologist who's, who's based in London and is available for work if you want to. Dr. Robin Farrow, and he helped us to redesign the way we engage with people, the way we listened to local residents, rather than making judgments about their lives and what is best for them, but having a blank mind and listening, deep listening, ethnography, the study of how people behave, the study of society and, and what makes people do certain things. And I think for the work that you're engaged in, that kind of deep listening is so important to individuals and, and to communities. Or else the things that we design, the programmes we devise will just be completely useless because they're not grounded in reality. So every single thing that we commissioned uh, as a, and I was the accountable officer for the clinical commissioning group, as well as the chief exec of the council, was co-designed with local people. We did some work on a a reimagined sexual health service, for example, which previously was a really old fashioned, almost Victorian service, um, really confusing and not based on the needs of uh, particularly young people. So we work with groups of young men and young women to redesign that service around their experiences and their, the day to day reality of their lives and what would work for them. So it's, it's critical that that deep listening is part of every single thing that you do. We did something similar with drug and alcohol services as well, where we used people who'd have lived experience of, of drug and alcohol issues and then helped them to um, pull together programmes and gave them the freedom and back them to redesign those programmes. And quite different to how a CCG normally commissions services or a council, which is in a darkened room <laughs> with no exposure to the reality of people's lives. We also did, with Robin Farrow, some work on um, going into local communities, everybody who worked in public services, and having the Be Wigan uh, Behaviours Training, where we talked about how we can be positive, accountable to local people, and courageous. So the whole idea of the deal was to prevent, and we had um, some fantastic successes. So the, the main outcome that the King's Fund highlighted as being a great success, which others have uh, found useful, is healthy life expectancy. So that's the number of years that you live with good health. So in Wigan at one point, it was um, it was only 50 for men. We funded 500 amazing projects. We didn't top down commission them because we thought we knew what people wanted. We asked the community what they wanted and we put 13 million into that over an eight year period and 500 amazing projects were funded. Importantly, they weren't based on micromanagement of those projects we said look we trust you to deliver the outcomes you said you will go away and do it we're not going to micromanage you uh, go away and do it and in return because the nature of the power shifted to them rather than us holding all the power and spending more on micromanagement and monitoring of projects than we were actually giving them um, we found we got much better buy-in outcomes, the trust built between public servants and the community and voluntary sector and it was that additional seven years in the most deprived wards of healthy life expectancy that we managed to add during the period of the deal. I just wanted to say something as well about measurements. I, you know, you, you tend to get boards who are cabinets, council cabinets or steering committees who are a bit obsessed with measurement. Um, and sometimes they feel it's their job to kind of beat up the executives because they're not achieving the KPIs on in a particular quarter or a particular month. Um, one thing really brought it home to me about, about how um, measurement is an imperfect science and how sometimes we, we obsess and we spend all of our time and energy on measuring the wrong things. So there was a guy um, who was often coming to Wigan Hospital. Um, he was, we did, we risk stratified uh, people who were coming into hospital for an unplanned hospital admission in Wigan. And we found that there were, out of a population of 200, and, sorry, 323,000 people, there were 4,000 people who were at risk. And we thought they would be all older people at risk of a fall, but they weren't. They were people, half of them were people in their 40s and 50s 
with uh, mental health issues, drug and alcohol issues, uh, very poor uh, social connections, um, joblessness, uh, depression, lots of things going on in their lives. Um, and they were just kind of in a spiral, a revolving door of going to different places and no one was really helping them. Um, and this one guy in particular stuck in my mind. So we'd met, because we'd met every single KPI in relation to this gentleman, he wasn't on anyone's radar, but he was going to hospital, whether it was Wigan or Lee or Bolton, because they're quite close to each other every single day for a year. But because we'd seen him within a four hour time frame, which is the target that the NHS measures obsessively, you know, uh, four hour waits, uh, no one had, had actually twigged there was a problem. There'd been no, there'd been inadequate liaison with his GP around his medication, no liaison with um, anybody from the Department of Work and Pensions, no liaison with his family or mental health services. But according to everybody in the system, everything was fine because we'd met the KPI. So we're measuring the wrong things, aren't we? We we need to. I, I love broad-based outcomes measurements. So healthy life expectancy, is it going up or going down? Where is it going up? Which locality is it going up in? Data is important to drive decision-making, particularly when you come to risk stratifying and prioritising where you put your attention. You have to find a way of measuring, but it's great that integrated care systems now have got a bit more freedom to do that. Um, so I think it should be around distance travelled, gaps closed, you know, um, physical activity improvements in an area, you know, and particularly looking at um, not that kind of standard KPI measurement, but the quality of what the kind of support that they've had and how they feel. Those human stories are always much more powerful than that cold KPI that doesn't really measure the right thing. But it's still going. Um, it wasn't about me or the political leaders. It was about a place and a plan for a place, which is a long term plan for a place. So you're ideally placed in this partnership to do that. You know, you've got you've got longevity, you've got plan, you've got, uh, you know, a plan, you've got buy in from the partners. So it's really, really exciting. But you do need courage. You know, that's the one thing that you can't get through a government funding pot. You need to have the courage of your convictions to really shake things up. I mean, the one starting point there to back you on your courageous journey is if we carry on doing what we've done for the last 40, 50 years since the creation of the welfare state, we're doomed because it's on a, a crash course for failure because we've got increasing demand, reducing resource base, um, you know, and, and lots of other pressures on the system as well with other things that are happening in the world and and in the UK. So we've got to try new things, but leaders need to think outside of their traditional barriers of thinking, and everyone needs to have a role in leading this. We've got to trust our frontline people to get on with it. You know, vampires in the system, whether they're sat on the management team or whether they're on the front line, need to be exited. I'm sorry to say it sounds horrible, but there will be people who'll be trying to block this different way of working. And, you know, we've not got the time to mess about with the, the naysayers. Scepticism is healthy, cynicism is not. So, you know, some bold recruitment decisions are needed by uh, by everyone when you're trying to do stuff like this, um, you know, and, and keep smiling because this is, you know, what is the alternative to this kind of different way of working? Would encourage you to read Lessons from the Wigan Deal and um, Hilary Cotton, Radical Help, and uh, hope you have a great day and I'll see you later on the panel. Now, if I may invite ask, invite the panel to turn their cameras on. So um, joining Donna on the panel today, we've got Wendy, Chantel, Rachel and David. So if, if I can just ask you to put your cameras on and rather than go to the clips, if, if everybody's happy just to say a few words, introduce themselves like, and um, a bit about their work and then we'll go into a question and answer session. Um, a little bit different to what we have planned, but um, this is this is thinking on our feet. So have we got um, my teams is playing up a little bit as well in just to add to the form. Um, have we got David and um, Rachel and Wendy? And Chantel with us. I've now put you on together mode so I can see you waving at me, which is great. So um, Wendy, do you just want to start by introducing yourself and saying a little bit about your work? And quite interesting to hear how um, what you've heard today links with the the, um, the movement that Sport England is uh, seeking to uh, achieve. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Um, and hi, everyone. My name is uh, Wendy Campbell. I'm from Sport England and I'm part of a small team that works with active partnerships uh, within uh, Sport England. 
And it, what, what I would say is that at, at its very core, uniting the movement is a call to action. Um, it's a recognition that we cannot possibly achieve the vision that's set out on our own. So similar to what Donna's talking about in Wigan, it's, this isn't one person's answer here or one organisation's answer. And it was a strategy that was built together. So colleagues right across this room, including Active Nottinghamshire and Active Derbyshire, helped us to make sure that by the time the strategy was produced, it reflected what we all were learning and what we were all seeing and hearing um, in communities across England. And, and what I've heard today, Michelle, is very much that perfect blend of uniting the movement reflected in the needs and the circumstances of Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire. And I think that's the key to it is it's it's about communities and and within that there are hundreds and thousands of communities, each with their differing needs, but it's about making it relevant to the place. And, and, and I think Alana said, you know, it's not a linear solution. This isn't going to be simple and there is no one way to enable people to be active. But we do know that the communities that people live in have a huge impact um, on their ability and their their motivations to be active and and not only the communities, but the people that they spend their lives with. That's wonderful. Thank you, Wendy. So I'm going to ask Rachel, uh, David and Chantal just to introduce yourself, say who you are and a little bit about your work before we get into the question and, and answers. So Rachel, can I start move on to you and then then on to Chantal after? That'd be great. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle. And thank you for inviting me. And I'm Rachel North, Deputy Exec at Derby City Council. And I would just have to say at the beginning that obviously Donna is a bit of a legend in our sector at how you work differently around you know, being a local authority and a role of local authority. We're trying to do some of those things in Derby in not as in an organisers way as perhaps Donna managed to achieve, but we you know, have the same general philosophy. And for me, fundamentally, it's recognising the complexity of life and recognising that organisations, professions, services, sectors aren't very helpful in dealing with the complexities of life. It's really, we're human beings, we're all human beings, so how can we work with the strengths we have as human beings individually and collectively to try and do the best we can to live the best lives we can live? So from a council point of view, how do we leave our lanyards at the door? How do we work collectively in an open-minded way, forgetting what profession we might be from or what service we might represent, and work with what's in our communities to try and build that resilience that makes it more likely incredible community activities and projects that take place from allotments to hip hop to wrestling clubs to you name it those are the things that make us as human beings more able to live reasonable effective lives and they give us that confidence to, to you know, do everything that makes that happen including being physically active and so how do we work along the grain of those things that already exist to try and create more opportunity and just not think and I, I use a slide quite often of a, a complicated um, pile of multicolored spaghetti and I just say this is our system this is the reality of it it's really complicated and messy and, and none of us invented it so try and accept that's reality but actually work with people and I have to have that as, as Donna has said really well you know people have incredible strengths and we often we take this very deficit model where we say oh, this is a deprived community or they're hard to reach or they're really vulnerable as if we have to f fix things and actually a lot of those people have strengths and abilities in there we can actually work along the grain of to get better outcomes so we do some great work as probably many of you know in derby city in particular neighborhoods working through our active derbyshire partners and variety of our partners inside the council to really support those barriers to activity and finding ways to unlock it so just sort of generally we're trying to do some of those things in our in the best way we can but really that, good to be with thank you that's brilliant rachel thank you a very insightful snapshot into um your work and thoughts in relation to derby city Chantal, do you just want to introduce yourself and say a little bit about your work yeah, hi, um, my name is Chantal Stabanovich. I'm a resident in the St Anne's area, which is in um, inner city Nottingham. Um, I've also worked in St Anne's for over the past 15 years. Um, biggest thing for me is always about been empowering my community. So due to me being part of it as a young child, I really wanted to be able to give back and was able to kind of identify certain aspects that were potentially missing within our community. So now I'm a youth engagement manager. 
Um, we provide bespoke mentoring, diversionary programs, anything really that we know the community need. What we'll try and do is try and muster up together, going through the system of that messy spaghetti, and um, Rachel, as you um, rightfully says, and just try and bring that community together and provide what they need to empower them. I think one of the biggest things that we've noticed is, it's like Rachel said, we have a lot of hard to reach people and they are such strong, empowering, amazing people that, sorry, my electric keeps going, so I do apologise, keep going dark and light. Um, but yeah, they are some absolutely amazing, powerful people in our community. And it is just providing them the right platform to harvest and harness those skills to kind of provide them and move them forward. So we work with a lot of children, young people, families, anyone really that just wants to kind of grasp an opportunity and we try and empower them in any way we can to help them. Brilliant, Chantelle, that's really great to hear. You talk with such passion as well, which is is really, really uh, nice to see. Um, David, I'm just, before we hear from you, encouraging people, if you've got any questions that you'd like to face to the panel, just to note them down. And, and when David has finished, we can um, type them in the chat. We've got, we've got a few here to kick starters off, but if there's any burning questions for anybody that's listening, please do um, note them in the chat. So David, do you want to introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit about your work. Brilliant, thanks very much and what an uplifting session this has been already thanks to everybody that spoke and I certainly feel uh, like I've got a real energy in, uh, and, a, and a real fire in my belly for this agenda so thank you and thanks to the organisers. I'm David and that means I basically look after everybody that lives in Mansfield, Ashfield, Newark and Sherwood, so the middle of Nottinghamshire. And, um, you know, we've already said, haven't we, we, we are coming out of COVID. People are facing real tough times. You know, some of our communities, uh, frankly, you know, in, in one area, you know, over 68% of adults and around 23% of year six children are overweight. Um, we've got 21% of children living in uh, low income families um, and, um, you know, high high levels of inactivity and deprivation and inequality. And, and I think it was Rachel that struck a chord with me. None of that, you know, we're not here to judge people, are we? And it's time that we took off our uh, badges and our organisational lanyards and came together in the way that others have said that actually we owe it to the people we work with and represent and, and work for for and we owe it to ourselves because we know don't we that um, inactivity levels lead unfortunately to overweight which leads to blood pressure and diabetes which over the years leads to heart attack strokes and and cancer and the like so there's an imperative isn't there for us to do this and frankly we're working now in the middle of nottingham with partners across health, social care, local authorities in the way that uh, colleagues have, have already said. Uh, my final point then would be about leadership. And for me, if you watch the video that's, uh, that was made for this afternoon, you'll hear me talking passionately about leadership. Um, so I might have a fancy title, but uh, frankly, leadership isn't hierarchical um, and neither should it be. You know, it's time we took off our suits. It's time we took off the ties. It's time we leveled with people. And frankly, this is not about those people over there. It's about all of us, all of our lives and all of our families. And frankly, the leaders all of you watching this this afternoon so just by being here says to me that you are a leader and you have the ability to make your voice heard and to make a difference for local people so please keep showing up please keep engaging in this agenda and please support us to make the lives of our local population much better thank you that's really great, um, David, and, and lovely to have health on board in, in this conversation alongside everybody else today. Um, I can see that questions are coming in. If I may, Chantelle, come to you first. I can see that Karen, um, who I know that you know, has posted it in, in the chat and so would love to hear a little bit more about what it takes to really hear the voices that are, are not often heard. So I don't know if you want to say uh, anything in response to that. Um, yeah, so obviously being a resident and being um, a, 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 well, around in the area, it, it does help, but there's also a kind of double-edged sword to that. So because you're present in the area, a lot of people will have a lot of trust in you. And when you're trying to kind of support people and put them onto different providers, 
you kind of get stuck in the middle of well Chantal you said these were really good so it really really does help that when you are present in that area and being a resident um that a lot of the things being a leader for me is I actually had to sit down and thought, what does it look like? And I had to sit down and self-reflect, which is something that I don't think we do quite often. So it was nice to actually sit and self-reflect for the first time. Um, empowering other people. One of the biggest things for me is belief. Um, being a resident as a young person, I didn't have much belief. People didn't believe in me. I'm from St. Anne's. I'm part of, you know, a group and there's not that much belief. And having someone external that's going, no, I believe in you. You can do this. It, it does so much for being that leader. And um, also as well, having the ability to be relatable and accepting. You know, a lot of people, we go through the system and a lot of people bat us down. No, you can't do this. No, that's not acceptable. Um, so having someone that really understands you and accepts you for who you are, accepts you at the fact that, you know, being active, a lot of people aren't very active and they, they get really, really self-conscious regarding that. So regarding the activity, accepting others for who they are and believing in them is something humongous. But the trust element, there are two sides to it, being trusting and being trusted. Um, a lot of people feel let down, left, right and centre by many different organisations, by themselves, by family, by their neighbours next door. And um, to be trusted and then to be trusting, that is so, it, it just means more to a lot of people because a lot of people sometimes they don't they don't have that person that believes in them or trusts in them. Um, so the biggest things for me, like I said, was empowering other people, being extremely relatable. You don't have to be from the community to be relatable. You've got to listen with open ears and not listen to pass a comment or judgment. Just take it on board. That's their truth. That's that's what's real to them. For you to sit there and have a, an ulterior thought process of, well, what about this? It just kind of sidelines their own feelings and their own thought processes. So empowering relatability, accepting others for who they are, being trusted and trusting. And one of the biggest things that I've always said is I'm an extended family member. I'm your auntie, I'm your uncle, I'm your friend that's down the road. And when you look left, right, up, down and no one's there, I will be there, don't worry. And just to have that lifeline, really, it works wonders. And it just slowly builds that trust where you know, when they've not, when they haven't been accepted by others, when they're not getting what they need, just to have that someone to relate to and, and put your head on their shoulder and listen to them consciously, it helps so much. And that's where the engagement then comes into it for me. Sorry. That's, no, that's <laughs> brilliant. And again, the passion, very um, strong. Thank you, Shanto. Um, I'm going to come to Donna and Rachel, if I may, just to sort of, um, you'll have heard earlier, Alana, talk about we're really keen to grow the, the relationships that we have and the trust, the way we relate to each other across organisations and in communities is really quite important. From your experience and perspective, are there any challenges or things that are likely to get in the way or any tips that you've got for us listening? to this call um, today to, to progress with that. So should I come to you first, Donna, and then, then to Rachel um, after, if that's OK? I think the main barrier is um, we've been trained, haven't we, to be competitive. You know, from a very early age, we're trained to be the best, the biggest, the best, the most successful, um, you know, through school and then through, you know, in organisations, leaders are prized because they bat for their organisation rather than batting for people and batting for the system. So I think that's one of the biggest barriers. And I think system leadership, which is what you're doing here, um, requires a different skill set. It requires that deep listening that Chantelle's just kind of outlined, that building of trust, that relatability. So I, I think we need, um, I wish I'd seen your video, David, but we need to get a different type of, of leader and we need to get everyone to lead from every seat in the room like this session is. Uh, you know, and we used an anthropologist extensively and redesigned the way that we listened. Um, so we used eth ethnography, so the quiet observation of of how people live and relating to them and living alongside them was how we redesigned, you know, with people the deal. And um, and everyone was trained in that, in how to deeply listen and with a blank mind, not to make snap judgments and decisions about what's best for people. People know what they want and we've just got to listen more deeply. So I think that's the type of um, barrier we've got to overcome. 90% of the deal was system development, organisational development, uh, values based, um, 
immersive experiences that we designed across the system. I don't know whether you've done something like that um, in Derby and Nottinghamshire, but you know, and it was it was hosted by frontline staff and residents rather than by leaders like myself. Thank you, Donna. Rachel, um, anything from your perspective to add? I think it it's so important to create the environment that makes it easier. So I mean, in very simple terms, what we've been trying to do in Derby and in other places I've been in is to is to bring officers from that the local authority and with other partners together to share experiences and what's happening around place. So you know, often with you know our boundaries are very large. Quite often, obviously, CTG larger than mine are, but. It, or you lose sight as a point. I think people, I think very simplistically, it's about people and it's about places. And if we can bring officers together around a place, allow them to be flexible and take some risks and forget the lanyard and what the service might offer might be or their prescription, you know, threshold might be and just work alongside people in the way Donna described, understanding the value in those people. You can then link up issues around the pavements being poor and, you know, people not exercising enough or feeling safe. Those other agendas suddenly become how do we solve those things then collectively rather than I've got this bit of the jigsaw, which sounds quite simple to say, but it's quite hard to do because there's so many cultural barriers that sort of stop us getting into that place and just trying to find solutions looking alongside people so i think as leaders is to make that the norm make it easier you know encourage that environment thank you rachel i'm, I'm going to come to david and then wendy and i'm just mindful of time but i would then after after we've heard from david and, and wendy invite you just to give a couple of a, a message back to the audience to sort of sum up the sort of to help us on on our way but david before we do that I, i'm really keen to hear from you and i know you, we will share um the the clips because you talk very passionately about about leadership um, and if you've got anything to add in relation to those challenges and and, and in particular um, we've heard measurement because sometimes can get in the way and if there's anything specifically that you've got to say in relation to that. Yes, thanks very much. So um, first of all, um, we need a seismic mind shift change, don't we? Nationally, regionally, uh, but also locally. Uh, we've been driven far too long by targets and people have worked incredibly hard to hit targets and very often miss the point. Uh, and you know that what we measure in the future has to absolutely fundamentally be different. You know we've got to move towards measuring outcomes for people. We've got to stop measuring, in my opinion, the number of knee operations we put through the orthopedic theatres, and much more towards um, how quickly can we get people living pain free. How soon can we help people back into work? How soon can we help people be active and lose weight because of the pain that they're originally in? That's the world we have to move towards, much more around prevention and much more around a proactive approach. And we've got some fantastic people of a similar mindset on that page. Uh, the final thing I would say, just watching through some of the chat in the forum is absolutely the voluntary sector is key to all this and we have to have the voluntary sector front and center with us and alongside us because if you know our social prescribing model in nottinghamshire is going to be successful the social prescribing link workers need those voluntary services to be available and just as a reminder to fly the flag voluntary services are not free they still have to buy toilet rolls hand gel um, and they'd still have to train their staff so don't think that voluntary is a free option either thank you I'm really glad that you made that point, David. I know that in the clips that comes through very strongly and, and great to he hear that today. So I'm just going to wrap up and give everybody the opportunity to just, if you want to on the panel, to just say a couple of words to the audience today to sort of help us on our way in this work. And, um, you know, I'm fairly sure it won't be play, plain sailing all, all, all the way. We've, we've got lots, as you say, lots of really great things going on and lots to build on. Um, but I also anticipate that we may well have a few challenges and bumps in the road. So, um, Wendy, I don't know if there's anything that you just wanted to, to say in terms of um, moving final parting um, thoughts based on what you've heard and what we've got to do. Yeah, I, I think I think it's just as simple as we can't do it alone. And, and similar to what Rachel's saying is I think just that massive shift of stopping trying to think that we've got the solutions as organisations and working with people to empower them to create their own solutions feels like the most important 
I'm part here and continually learning together as a system. Keep keep doing that as much as we possibly can. That's Thanks, brilliant. Michelle. Thank you, Wendy. Chantal, a few words from you, then then Donna, uh, Rachel and David. Yeah, um, just obviously what the lady said before, the solution. The solution, like as you said, doesn't lay with us. It lays in the community. We've just got to start opening our ears. We've got to start listening. And also, I think the biggest thing for me is We've got to target these so-called hard to reach people. They're the voices you need to hear. The ones that are going to speak to you aren't going to give you the answer because they've got the answer for themselves. Let's start listening to the people. Let's knock on doors. Let's build that. Let's build that community feel again. Let's get some trust. I put something in the um, chat about the word imperfect. You know, we need to show that we're not perfect. I'm not a role model. I'm just really, really trying to do better for myself and for the community. And once people start realizing that you're human too, and you make mistakes, that shyness, that worry, that, that judgmental thought process slowly starts to go and they slowly start to believe in themselves within their community. And that's where our answers are. We all need to pull together and build it back again. Brilliant, thank you, Chantelle. Donna? Yeah, I think my message is about courage and holding your nerve uh, because some of this stuff is quite difficult and it's quite countercultural to the way that organisations have traditionally operated with very top down target driven outcome outputs that they've you know, measured against and they're not, it's not based on human connection and you know, kindness and compassion and shared respect for each other. So I think holding your nerve, um, tackling bad behaviours, as and when they rise, you know, it sounds a bit judgmental, but there'll be people even at quite senior levels who don't want this to happen because it threatens their power base. So, you know, doing that, exposing that behaviour and making it just the way you work in Derby and, and Nottingham every single day. It's not a project. It's just what you do all the time and sticking with it. Brilliant. Thank you, Donna. Rachel and then David. I mean, everything Donna just said, obviously, <laughs> but um, I mean, just recognise it's quite difficult and there are always going to be things that get in the way, whether that's red tape or processes or budget cuts or, you know, requirements. That, that's just the reality of it. But keep the faith in it. I think that's the real critical thing is keep faith. And I think as sets of partners, we are now need to be on the best game we've ever played because actually the impact of the pandemic on our people, our, all of us, are so unknown and enormous. We have to be the best that we can be. So sort of, you know, believe in it and keep going despite some of the challenges that could be in the way. Thank you, Rachel. And David, last but not least. Yeah, thanks. And I, I hope this strikes a chord uh, as we close our comments. And um, for me, it's uh, keep hope. Uh, it's really easy to look at some of the headlines, isn't it, around not enough of this, not enough of that, too much, you know, too much of uh, whatever. Um, actually, it feels like we're in a really good position uh, across Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire. So keep hope uh, that we can make a real difference this time and keep connected and keep talking, because the more we talk and the more we connect and the more we listen to each other, the more hope we'll build and the more of a chance we've got of being really successful. So really good luck to everybody and thanks for attending and thanks for inviting me. Well, and thanks for speaking, not just you, Dave, but all of you. For, that was very inspiring. The comments in the chat are, are sort of um, are saying so. And just thank you, everybody, for your questions that we um, focus very deliberately on the ways of working and the how. But we will respond to those questions we didn't get round to in, in the chat. So thanks once again to um, everybody for that thinking on the feet, feet a little bit. It wasn't quite as we planned, but um, thank you very much for um, taking the time to be part of the panel today. I'm going to hand back to Mark. Uh -huh. Thank you, Michelle. I should give a round of applause here, I think, from everyone. Uh, it was great to see I mean, the quality of the panel, to see how many uh, comments were, were sparked off in the chat. And as, as, as you said, Michelle, we'll get round to collating the questions and giving you answers for those that we didn't manage to tackle now. So thanks, Wendy. Uh, Rachel, Chantel, David and Donna. David, I think you nailed it. You said it was uplifting. That was a, a great word and I certainly feel uplifted by what I've heard over the last uh, 45 minutes or so. Um, achieving this vision is going to be a huge collective effort and if you haven't done so already, I'm inviting you on behalf of Active Knots and Active Derbyshire to consider what part you can play 
And if you needed any sort of inspiration about what can be achieved, then just go back and listen to Donna's talk. You know, there were so many examples there in that short space of time that are really, really achievable. You can get copies available of uh, the, the document about the launch today at, um, from our websites, two websites, www.activenots.org.uk and uh, activederbyshire.org.uk. Uh, for those of you that have registered, you should receive a summary version in the post with some motivation to get involved. So in wrapping up, I just want to say thank you very much for joining us today for your time and contributions. We recognise that this is a continuing conversation with all our partners and organisations and communities, and uh, yet you really do all have a part to play. As the work continues to evolve and develop, we invite you to get involved and to continue the conversation with the Active Knots and Active Derbyshire teams and amongst yourselves too, and it's great to see that's already happening in the chat. Um, on behalf of the organisation, I just want to recognise everyone here today. Uh, thank you for your time and your efforts. And for those who've been energised and engaged in the sessions leading up to this point, thank you. There'll be plenty more follow ups. I can assure you of that and next steps as we bring this to life and make our move in Notts and Derbyshire. So thank you. Uh, keep in touch. Uh, thanks for enjoying the vagaries of teams and remote working. And I'm going to try and leave you with another reminder of why we're here. And it's a video and some of you may not see this and we'll send a link around. Some of you will see it without having to do anything. And some of you might have to press a play button. So thank you. And we'll go out with this inspiring video. Fingers crossed. Thanks, Ben. We live in a busy world, hectic, suffocating, chaotic, with little time to do what's important. Surrounded by technology, on top of each other, with little space to move. Our streets, our communities, our villages, our towns, our city, our county. It's everywhere, all encompassing, attacking our health, our enjoyment, our social and mental well-being and contributing to our climate crisis. Inactivity is taken over and Covid has made this so much worse. It affects us all. We need to change. We need our councils, schools, healthcare, workplaces, families, friends, communities, everyone to work together, to lead the change, to make it happen, to start moving. It's all of us, all of the time, and now, we're ready to make our move. Are you?